Thank you for joining our webinar, Ending Non-Consensual uh, Filming and Distribution of the Pornographic Videos. The challenges, best practices, and lessons in various countries. Good morning and good afternoon and konbanwa. I'm Hiroko Goto, professor of Chiba University Law School and vice president of Human Rights Now, which organizes this session. This session is part of uh, the CSW parallel event. It's held in New York. And Human Rights Now is international human rights NGO based in Tokyo. In today's digital world, many people suffer from non-consensual uh, filming and distributing of the pornographic videos. And as a result, victims of forced appearance in the pornographic video have to live their life with so-called digital uh, footprints or uh, digital tattoos. Even the image, sexual images is uh, posted uh, in uh, consensual. Also, uh, we'll have the same problems. Today, we have invited experts uh, from the US and the, U the UK to learn about the challenges and the practices related to non-consensual uh, porn, uh, porn and uh, also the consensual uh, the sexual images. Considering the nature of cyberspace, we will also talk about close jurisdictional cases in order to explore ways to tackle the issue uh, across the borders. So it is my great honor uh, to introduce four wonderful guest speakers here with us. Ms. Roruna Woods, and a professor of internet law at the University of Sussex, Essex. Sorry, so my, um, and also Ms. Sophie uh, Mortimer, manager of the Revenge Porn Helpline and of the Stop NICII.org. And Ms. Michelle Gonzalez, executive a director of Cyber Civil Rights Initiatives, and Ms. Cindy Gallup, founder and CEO of Make Love Not Porn. Thank you all for joining us. And my colleague Kazuko Ito, Vice President of Human Rights Now and Attorney at Law in Japan, will also give a presentation. So we will start now, and now uh, I would like to give the floor uh, to our first speaker, Luna. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for inviting me here today, and to the audience, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be. I, I start with an apology. I, I feel somewhat of a fraud. Um, on this panel because I am not an expert in image-based uh, abuse. I am a professor of internet law uh, at the University of Essex and so my, my expertise comes from that field. But increasingly it seems that there is uh, a connection, an overlap. Uh, we see that social media for example, can be used uh, as a space where uh, predators, for want of a better word, can find information um, to groom people uh, to, to be able to exploit them subsequently or to, to make a, uh, false advertisements for uh, you know, modeling positions. And also more basically, it, it, they are platforms uh, on which people share material they've created. And there seems to be an increasing problem of the sharing by so-called boyfriends 
of videos and photographs of their girlfriends without consent, without knowledge. So there is an overlap, I think, between the, the regulation, the attempts to regulate uh, the internet and social media in particular, and this question. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a project I've been involved in with a, a number of charities and NGOs. And so the, the name check is Carnegie UK Trust and Violence Against Women and Girls, Glitch, NSPCC, Refuge, the Five Rights Foundation, and also um, Professor Claire McGlynn, uh, who is an expert in image-based abuse. Uh, she is at the law school at uh, Durham University. Now, what we did was talk about a code of practice to sit against the proposed regulatory regime in the UK, what's currently the online safety bill. Um, so this talk will focus on that, but I would say at this point that my opinion is that the approach taken in this code is quite flexible. Yes, the version we've come up with is designed for the UK environment, but I think it could be used, suitably tweaked, of course, in another national environment as a self-regulatory code or in the context of international law. So before I talk about the code itself, I want to talk briefly about the approach that this code uses. And that's what I have called a systems-based approach to regulation. When we talk about um, image brace of abuse and the cause and the solutions of it, often the questions relate to take down, to removing the images. And that is undoubtedly an important part of the question. But it's not the only issue. If we look at social media, they are the environment, that they create the environment in which these images are shared. And so they have a role in creating the problem as well as just being the place where the problem is found. They're not neutral in that regard. So to elaborate this, I want to talk about a four stage model that we used. Now, the first is about content creation. And by that, I mean, how do we think about the creation of accounts or disposable accounts and anonymous accounts possible? We can then think about the filters and the controls on the uploading of content. Are there any? Or do they make the uploading one click uploads of photographs and videos very easy? We can then think about discovery and navigation. And this brings us into a, a terrain that I think has become a bit more popular or well known of late. And that is that the social media and also search engines tend towards um, perhaps more extreme content in an attempt to maintain user engagement, to keep people on the platforms to keep generating data and eyeballs for advertising. So this advertising driven model means that it is in the platform's interest to prioritize content that uh, is more extreme, elicits a stronger response. And I would say pornography of all types um, fits into to that description, but we can see this also as a vector in particular for um, non-consensual porn. It is possibly also an environment where uh, perhaps non-consensual porn can be found and shared by uh, those who are interested in it. 
We then come to the third stage, which is the user response. To what extent can users um, complain about content or flag content as problematic? To what extent can they protect themselves against content they don't want to see? And then finally, we come to the last stage, which is the content moderation and the content takedown and the ease of those platforms pr providing uh, easy complaints mechanisms, especially if we think of the specificities around image-based abuse. Do we really think that drop down menus are, are a way forward? Forms that perhaps require the full filling in of names and addresses? Um, you know, perhaps there are other ways of complaining when sensitive matters are in issue. So that is the, the framework. And what I did with uh, Carnegie and the other groups was to develop a, a code that looked at all these four stages in the communication tray, chain. And I'm just going to share my screen with you because hopefully you will see now um, the code that we came up with. And you can see that um, as the starting point, We've actually got two main principles that sit even before we get onto the distribution chain. And that is, first of all, acknowledging the responsibility of the platforms, the services uh, themselves, for the design of their service, and that they should have a responsibility for risk assessment risk mitigation and remediation and that this is accepted at the highest level in the company board level now this is uh, in a way following the approach that we see in the ruggy principles the ungps on on responsible business but also the approach that the OECD took uh, in its um, human rights uh, and business uh, guidance. The other main principle you can see there is safety by design, that when platforms are designing their, um, their, their service, they should actually think about the risks and think about the risks for distinct population groups within uh, not just users, but within a population as a whole, so that they should try to come up with appropriate safeguards or perhaps even not deploy some tools because of the risks. We could think, for example, can you really provide a nudification app that is safe by design? Uh, I, I can't think of a way because, um, and, and perhaps people can uh, come up with other examples, but on the whole, it is about taking control from the victim and turning them into a sexual object. If you look down to sections three, four, five, and six on the code, you can see here that four stage model coming through. So looking at the safeguards around access to the online service. Now, there's something here to be said about uh, anonymous and throwaway accounts. Um, that some people have pointed the finger at these sorts of accounts in terms of online abuse, abuse and particularly campaigns of online abuse. But there is a huge advantage to anonymous accounts for some forms of vulnerable groups. So it is not that <clears throat> features are automatically bad or good, but just that they each carry a risk. So if we look at um, anonymity, 
there was a proposal when the Digital Services Act went uh, through, which was ultimately rejected, but dealt with the uh, issue of uh, non-consensual um, images being shared. And that was to say that platforms should have a system whereby those people wanting to upload or share um, intimate images should at least be identifiable by the platform so that then subsequently if there turned out to be a problem uh, and perhaps for the purposes of en enforcing the, the criminal law that there was a way of tracking the person. So these are the sorts of um, questions that you might ask. Uh, I've mentioned nudification apps and, and whether those are um, appropriate. Another question is terms of service and whether they adequately dis identify and describe the problem uh, around non-consensual image uh, um, abuse. So this could be about the sharing of images, but it could be more broadly about the use of the platform and particularly the use of advertising, perhaps to recruit um, unwitting uh, volunteers to this industry. Discovery and navigation, I've, I've talked about what do these services optimize? What do they prioritize? And could they do it better? User response is um, a way of identifying uh, problem content. And as I've said, that there should be perhaps some way of recognizing um, expert voices within the user group as one mechanism for finding sorts of content that sometimes doesn't look that different from legitimate content. User tools uh, might be uh, useful. They don't necessarily take away the problem, but if somebody is suffering from, I, I, I think the phrase digital tattoo, and seeing that material again, or being tagged by people uh, in relation to that material, having better controls over those sorts of um, engagements could be a benefit. Um, moderation is the uh, final bit um, I want to talk about in terms of the model. I, I think we would all wish that uh, major platforms did a better job of responding to user complaints and uh, enforcing terms of service equally. What I would suggest is that as part of moderation uh, requirements and standards is that they should have in-house appropriately qualified people who can spot the problem or who can recognize where there are issues or respond appropriately to victims of crime in this um, context. We uh, put some other issues uh, following on from this. Transparency specifically relates to um, the requirements of the online safety bill. But I think providing information more generally as to the risk, the level of incidence and what's happening on a service is a good idea and can also help victim advocates and NGOs. It is important, I think, that there are resources for victim support and remediation, as you see there, and also that the platforms take responsibility for their supply chains, that they don't say deal with concerns about nudification apps by saying, oh, well, that was provided by somebody else. That's not our problem. Education and training quite often refers to media literacy, but here this relates back to the point I made that those in house and particularly those uh, in moderation, but also those I think in design 
should be educated about the issues so that they at least stand a better chance of recognising them. And finally, vigilance over time is a recognition that the market changes, that services change, and so that solutions that work now may not be adequate going forward and that we need to maintain vigilance over time. I will leave it there, but I'm happy to elaborate on any of that uh, should anyone like to ask me about it or even about the online safety bill if people want to know about that. So thank you for uh, explaining the framework and, uh, and also that uh, it's a very complicated and uh, I heard a very uh, wrong uh, the code of the Online Safety Act. Thank you. There was the next speaker, uh, Sophie, please take the floor. Thank you very much. And it's really lovely to be here today. Um, I, I hope you can hear me over the background noise. It was in fact quiet when I started, but um, no longer. So I hope that's not too much of a problem. And I'm just sharing my screen. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work of the helpline just to give a bit of a background. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the, um, the law in the UK uh, around intimate image abuse, the sharing of non-consensual intimate images without consent and, and how the, framing of that law uh, creates barriers for, for victims to achieve any sort of redress or, or justice in many cases. Um, but there are some changes coming as, as Lorna's uh, started to talk about. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and then about um, stopnci.org, which is a, a fairly new project from us. So um, I'm going to start here. Uh, I think I can just change my slides. So the Revenge One Helpline was uh, established in 2015, um, at the same time as it became a, a criminal offence in the UK to share intimate images without consent. Um, and that came with uh, a number of uh, provisos, which I will, I will go through in detail in just a minute. Um, but since that time, uh, the helpline uh, has sort of established four fair, fair areas of, of support. And those are where intimate images have been shared without consent where there are threats to share intimate images, voyeurism or the, the creation of intimate content uh, without the knowledge of one of the, the participants in that, and sextortion uh, web, or webcam blackmail, which is a very different uh, uh, dynamic really. And around sextortion, we see that the majority of victims are male, um, but for the other three areas and the majority of our work, predominantly victims are female and as far as we are, we can tell for those that disclose, uh, perpetrators are male. Uh, so, but what we also have learned is that intimate images, uh, whether they're shared or threatened to be shared, uh, it's, it's not something that happens in isolation. We see that people are always uh, very often experiencing other issues as well. And, and you can see from, from this graph that somebody's having intimate images shared, they might also be experiencing harassment, uh, having accounts hacked, personal information shared, but it's called doxing, uh, uh, and behaviours such as collector culture, where content is shared and reshared and collected and traded on sites specifically for this purpose, where there, there may not be no connection with the, the original person who's in that content. Um, images that are, are violated uh, in themselves of people and then reshared, domestic abuse, trolling, there, there's, there are many, many behaviours that we see uh, around the sharing of intimate images. And it, it's over the eight years that we've existed, it's just become more and more clear that this is a really complicated area and, and sits very much under uh, a systemic uh, issue around violence against women and girls. Um, so the law in the UK that came in in 2015 um, a number of uh, criteria and officially it is the disclosing of private sexual photographs and films with an intent to cause distress and that intent to cause distress is something that um, that creates a huge issue for uh, somebody who's uh, had intimate images shared or who's being threatened because uh, in fact originally threats to share were not included in the legislation that came in I believe in 2021 with the Domestic Abuse Act but but to the the criteria of, of an intention to cause distress, that's a very difficult thing to prove. And we repeatedly have clients who come to us um, and they know and we can see the reasoning and that in the context of complicated behaviours, why that content has been shared. 
but demonstrating that to the police or for the police uh, to to be able to demonstrate with that with the Crown Prosecution Service, who is the organisation that takes through um, criminal convictions in the UK, to demonstrate that in a court of law is very difficult because the the legislation itself has defences written into it. Uh, people can say that they that they didn't think the the other person would mind if they shared the content. They thought they had concern. They did it for money. The, the, these things are all acceptable defences because it's very difficult because it also regardless of whether distress was actually caused there had to be that intention so that's a massive barrier towards people coming coming forward and and wanting to report to the police um the uh lack of anonym anonymity that was provided because it was classed as a uh communications offense not who have uh, experienced such a violation or uh, are um, feeling uh, so exposed and humiliated in front of uh, their, their peers and their friends, family, work colleagues, the, the, the idea of standing up in court where their name will be read out and where that could be shared um, in, in the local media, that, that's just too, too big a, an ask, unfortunately, for, for so many people, completely understandably. Um, also, the definition of a private sexual image within the law is very narrow doesn't include underwear images. And we have a client, a long-standing client, who has approximately 150 images of her in underwear in a bedroom. And they, they do not fall within the definition of an intimate image. But I can assure you that to her, to us, to anyone that viewed that, that is very intimate content. It might not meet the standard of the law, but it is causing very, very real, long-lasting harm to that person. It also doesn't currently include manipulated or altered images. And we're seeing a significant rise now in, in deep fakes and the use of nudification apps that Lorna mentioned. And it's really important that uh, we recognise as we move forward, we're going to see more of this sort of behaviour. And, and we need to uh, look at our legislation and, and future proof it. Um, so we can see the, the difficulties uh, that we see demonstrated by this data on, on, on reports. Um, that uh, with the police. So the, the yellow bars are, uh, this is a uh, research that was conducted through a freedom of information request um, that we commissioned with the University of Suffolk. And the yellow bars are incidents reported to the police. Um, and I think I've got some numbers. Um, in total, that totals uh, over the 2015 to 2022, that accounts for 24,010 incidents that were reported to the police. The red bar that you can see there is where charges were brought. That's 2,944 in total. So that's 12% of, of incidents that were reported to the police resulted in a charge. I you have to, might have to take my word for it, but there is a third bar there in a sort of gray blue color, which represents um, convictions. Uh, uh, and that uh, there are only 193 of those from the 33 forces that responded to our freedom of information requests. So that 6.5% of charges resulted in a prosecution, but only 0.8% of reports. So less than 1% of reports that were made to the police over that seven year period uh, actually led to a prosecution, which is, is deeply concerning and, and is the, the, the sort of uh, information that for somebody considering going to the police to report this would be deeply, deeply discouraging. I think it was clear from the first that the law was flawed uh, in this area. I think we certainly learnt that very quickly. Um, I, I think it was framed in a in a context where people thought this was about relationship breakdown, simply as if that was ever simple anyway, when actually it's a much, much more complicated picture. But there has been a recognition of that. And uh, several years ago, the government uh, commissioned the Law Commission, which is the organisation in the UK that reviews legislation, and they produced a, a really thorough report recommending a complete overhaul of the law in this area. Um, of course, we now need to wait for our government to implement that. But there are really positive noises coming now that that government intend to bring many of the changes that we would like to see in uh, as part of the online safety bill as it works its way through um, the parliamentary process in the UK. Um, and I think that those four main areas that I talked about um, around the intention to cause distress, anonymity, the inclusion of deep fake or manipulated images, and the definition of an image, we, we are hopeful that, that, that much of that is going to change. Um, and, and that's really important. And on the online safety bill, I would also add that the, the work that, that Lorna has been doing with um, 
the End Violence Against Women Coalition, Glitch, and those other partners around the development of the Code of Practice uh, is really, really important. And, and we fully support that work because um, we really believe that it'll serve to put the safety of women who are disproportionately affected by online abuse at the heart of, of this new regulatory framework and will lead to greater their greater safety. Um, so uh, just a quick uh, headline uh, on, on data um, as, as I move forward. Um, you can see that the number of cases that, that we've had um, has hugely increased as, as time has gone past. Uh, that's the bar chart on the left, the number of people that have come to us. Uh, we implemented a chatbot in 2022, which accounts for the slight drop, but the chatbot uh, sees a lot of people who come who are outside the UK, under 18 or experiencing sextortion. Um, and you can see the number of images that we've moved. We've got a sort of little, about, around about 90% uh, success rate in removing people's content. We've reported well over 300,000 individual images. And we've removed about 275,000 to date. So that brings me to um, stopncii.org, which is um, uh, uh, the con removal of content is a, is a huge part of the work that we do. And it's the first thing that people ask for when they come to us. It's more complicated that they need other sorts of support and, and opportunities for address. But in that, those first crisis moments, what they look for is removal of their content. And we've worked really hard building relationships with industry. And Meta, inevitably, the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, have been really, really uh, critical partners in that. As that's a place, it, those are the platforms where your friends, your family, your work colleagues are... And it's um, it, it, pe people are very keen to see see that content removed. So we have a long history of working with, with Meta on this to reduce the spread of non-consensual imagery. And they started some years ago now um, creating digital hashes, which is like a, a digital fingerprint, a unique identifier of an image. And they used these to stop the resharing of content. So if an image was reported to them as non-consensual intimate imagery, they would create a hash of that image and then that, those hashes are applied uh, in the same way that um, Im uh, images of children, uh, uh, sexual images of children are, are stopped from sharing on the platform. They use those hashes to stop the, the resharing of non-consensual adult content. But they realized that, that they needed to evolve. And so uh, they developed the Not Without My Consent program, which was where people could preemptively for the first time uh, have hashes created to stop their content being shared where there was a credible threat to share that. But it was a slightly cumbersome process. There needed to be a referral organization, and we were the referral organization in the UK. Um, and people had to, uh, they had to come to us. We had to confirm that it was an intimate image. Then we would send them, a, make a referral. Then they were sent a link, and they had to upload their images. And then the hashes would be created, and the images deleted by Meta. Um, but understandably, I think, people in this situation were very reluctant to share those intimate images um, with a major platform um, and, and send them anywhere. So we wanted to look at how uh, we could uh, it, uh, build something that would, would change that and would put some power back into the hands of people who were feeling deeply disempowered um, and, and threatened. Um, so Meta uh, came to us and we, we talked long and hard about how we could change things. Uh, so, uh, Moving forward, what was the vision? We wanted to develop a tool where the user would never lose control of their content. We wanted a tool that would be available to anyone wherever they were in the world, regardless of whether there was a support service. They would have access to that help. We wanted to develop a tool that could be accessed across multiple industry partners, wherever non-consensual intimate image content was shared. And so that came as brought us to stopncii.org. Um, and so that's the, the front page of, our, of the website, which was launched in December 2021. And it allows people to, um, to, to come to the platform um, and create their own images. And I think the slides will just help me demonstrate. No, maybe they won't. Um, so it's a free tool designed to support adult victims of non-consensual intimate image abuse globally. And it works by generating hash from intimate content directly from your device, sometimes referred to as a digital fingerprint. That, that uh, hash, as it's called, is unique to that image, and it cannot be reverse engineered if somebody were to access those hashes. StopNCI.org then shares their, their hash bank with participating companies so that they can help detect and remove the images from being shared online. Who can use StopNCI.org? 
anyone who is over 18 in the image. The image must be sexual in nature, so it must include sexual acts, nudity or semi-nudity. It also includes uh, deep faked or manipulated images. Um, the image must show the person creating the hash, but it doesn't have to show their face. And it doesn't matter if there's somebody else in it, but the person who is submitting uh, the hash to the hash bank, they need to be in that content. Uh, we were very, very proud to work with NECMEC, who wanted to develop uh, a version of the Stop NCII plat uh, platform for under 18s. And so it's the, the, the same technology, but that has now been launched uh, just a, a few weeks ago by NECMEC. Uh, take it down. Uh, so we, we're really keen to work with with partners across industry uh, to protect everyone uh, as far as they can as we can from having uh, their nudes shared online. So what's the future? It's about building. Um, the The platform launched in uh, in December 2021, and our first part participating partners were uh, Facebook and Instagram. And then we marked our first birthday of the platform in December 2022 with uh, the announcement of, of that we were being joined by TikTok and Bumble to also uh, to share in those hashes. And yesterday we were absolutely delighted uh, at the UNCSW uh, to, to announce uh, that we were now being joined by uh, OnlyFans and Reddit. So moving forward, uh, our main, our first focus is on adding to those platforms. To, to take these hashes, to stop and slow the sharing and resharing of this content. That's absolutely crucial. And, and we have really profitable and encouraging conversations going on with platforms across, across uh, social media, um, adult sites. We're very conscious that that's, that that's where a lot of this content is shared and reshared. And um, file sharing sites, uh, hostings, we will be speaking to anybody, anybody that takes hashes, has the ability, technology to take hashes, then, then we, we want them to, to take these to keep protecting people. We also work really closely with NGO services around the world because, as I said, we know that this content isn't shared um, in isolation and people need further support. So we have an extensive uh, list of partners on the platform, which is available in now 22 languages uh, and that, that will continue to develop and so that the, the platform will become further accessible to more and more people. And we want more people to join us. We want more people to know about the platform, to use the, the platform if they have any concerns that their content might be at risk. Because it's really important that we put this power back into the hands of people to be able to protect themselves um, and, and, and not live in fear uh, and, and, and deliver some peace of mind. So thank you very much for listening. I will be here for the, the questions. Um, if you have any, any questions, particularly about stopncii.org, there is our FAQs. If you'd like to support the platform, anyone who would like to join as an NGO or platform who might be here, please email us at joinstopncii at swgfl.org.uk. And if you can't find the answer to your question or you want to talk more about the project, you can email me at sophie.mortimer at swgfl.org.uk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Sophie, and for your presentation. So a lot of information included. And also that uh, thank you for sharing uh, the so good practice and uh, to protect the victims. And uh, maybe the, some problems still happen, so, but uh, maybe some challenges uh, still. Uh, you have some challenges so you might have uh, uh, still, but uh, it is a very good lessons uh, uh, from you. Thank you so much. And and now let us turn to our speaker from the United States, uh, Michelle. Uh, please take the floor. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our guests. I'd like to start off, um, and our panelists, especially those who. Um, have flown in from out of town to New York, to our hosts, um, to UN Women and Human Rights Now, and in particular, Maromi for coordinating this session. We are so grateful to each of you for your time, for your work. Uh, the presentation that I'll give today is designed with accessibility in mind. So it uses contrasting colors and large sans serif font. There are very few images 
that I will explain. Um, as you know, the presentation will be available for distribution, and I will try to uh, take a pause and speak slowly at each slide turn. Many of you are experts in this field. Nevertheless, if any subject matter arises that causes you discomfort, please do visit the CCRI Safety Center at cybercivilrights.org. Uh, Maromi asked me to speak today about challenges and best practices in raising awareness about deterring and providing support to individuals who have experienced image-based sexual abuse. Throughout this presentation, I will use the terms non-consensual explicit images or NCEI to speak more specifically about image dissemination. I'll also use the term IBSA or image-based sexual abuse coined by scholars Claire McGlynn and Erica Rackley. Uh, the four areas I'll touch on today, because we have 15 minutes, are our legislative landscape, community-wide support and direct services, recommendations for tech companies, and health and well-being um, for individuals who experience IPSA. I'll touch briefly on our legislative landscape. Please note that I am not a lawyer. Um, I know that our president and legislative and tech policy director, Dr. Marianne Franks, had loved, had really wanted to be here today to meet with all of you. Um, she actually will be joining the U.S. delegation to CSW67 as a non-government advisor. So in her absence, I'll do my best to highlight some challenges in our current legal landscape. First, many of you probably know that the US actually does not have a federal criminal law against NCEI distribution or sextortion. Uh, it was raised, I think, earlier in this session, the question about um, working across jurisdictions and in the United States, we have a patchwork of state laws that are confusing for survivors and for law enforcement. And Sophie explained so well about the issues that arise around the intent to cause harm, which is something that we struggle with in the US as well. We also um, have section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which creates very high hurdles for charges against website operators who host IPSA. We also know from our research that um, the absence of a federal law does create um, harm for people who experience IPSA. So CCRI led by Dr. Asia Eaton, our head of research and Florida International University, we are funded by the National Science Foundation to conduct a two-part study. And the interview portion of this study included 36 participants, age 18 and over, residing in the US, the gender that the participants self-identified as included 14 women, 17 men, three trans women, and two unknown. They all experienced IBSA during roughly 18 months that correlated with the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. And the following statements were shared during trauma-informed interviews. One participant said, we should have laws that protect people. For example, People who their images or their videos, which are private, are posted without their knowledge or consent. There should be laws prohibiting or punishing people. A second participant said, the legal system is just, it's so hard to navigate. 
there should be more material out there for it, and it should be easier to find. A third participant said, the policies exist. There are actually remedies in my state. The problem is law enforcement doesn't know them. The courts don't know them. The attorneys don't know them. So what are we doing to meet this challenge? Um, I mentioned our president, Dr. Marianne Franks. In 2013, 10 years ago, when CCRI was founded, she actually drafted a guide for legislators as well as model state and federal legislation. And those models have served as templates for multiple state laws and pending federal bills. One, fe one pending federal bill that was recently um, reintroduced uh, into the Senate just maybe a week ago. The number of US states prohibiting this abuse rose from three states in 2013 to 48, Washington, D.C., and the U.S. territories of Guam and Puerto Rico. As I mentioned, um, this led to the introduction of the SHIELD Act, which was uh, just reintroduced. Dr. Franks also served as the reporter for the Uniform Law Commission's mm -hmm. Civil Remedies for the Unauthorized Disclosure of Intimate Imagery Act of 2018. And a version of that was included in the VAWA reauthorization of 2022 as the first federal law to provide a civil remedy for NCEI. And she's currently advising Illinois lawmakers on um, a recently introduced Digital Forgeries Act in regard to synthetic media or deep fakes. CCRI has filed nearly a dozen amicus briefs in support of state laws protecting online privacy. And those briefs, along with the scholarship of CCRI leadership, are frequently cited by courts. Our Vice President Danielle Citrin and uh, Marianne have testified to Congress on Section 230 reform and deep fake manipulation. Uh, and CCRI leadership have served as invited expert advisors to the White House task force to address online harassment and abuse. If you'd like to view any of the materials that I just referenced, you can visit the legislative reform page on CCRI's website. I will also note that today at 2 p.m., CCRI board member, Hani Farid, who is actually known as the father of digital forensics um, due to his work on photo DNA. Um, so going back to that hashing technology that Sophie mentioned earlier. Uh, so uh, Hani Farid and Marianne Franks will actually be testifying before the subcommittee on privacy technology and the law at 2 p.m. today. And I can put that link in the chat. Um, I know many participants today will have many, many meetings to go to, but in case anyone is interested. So the second area that I can touch on today is community support and direct service. Um, we have experienced challenges in the various supports available throughout our communities for individuals who experience IBSA. Um, our understanding is that attorneys, FBI reporting, um, the Internet Crime Complaint Center, local law enforcement, direct service organizations have all experienced extreme backlogs in the last few years. At CCRI, we've experienced a similar skyrocketing of caseload. Our image abuse helpline uh, which offers emotional support, information, legal referrals, and the like, served 5,600 callers in 2022. That was our highest annual call volume ever and an increase of 87.1% as compared to the 2019 rate. In addition to those challenges, professional sex workers 
may face extreme barriers in accessing support due to social stigma, fear of law enforcement, theft of work product. I was so thrilled to hear yesterday when Sophie um, and STOP and CII made the announcement that um, OnlyFans in particular has joined STOP and CII. That's really um, such an incredible partner and um, I'm, I'm so excited to hear about that. So in an effort to address this challenge, what we're doing at CCRI um, is trying to create tools that can empower the individual with immediate and comprehensive information um, so that if they are waiting on hold or filing multiple reports, they can have um, access promptly to resources and information. In 2021, we launched the CCRI Safety Center, and that offers step-by-step -step guidance for individuals who are 18 years and older and who are experiencing IPSA. And last year, we published a CCRI bulletin related to sextortion scams. This is another area that touches on the cross-jurisdiction issues that were raised earlier. Um, many of the financial sextortion schemes that we see um, are cross-border and global in nature. And we'd love to ask attendees today to please help us disseminate these two tools to anyone in your caseloads or to the offices where you work, your colleagues, your contacts. So third, um, I think that I'm seeing that I might be running out of time. Two more minutes. Okay, I'll try to go quickly. Uh, many of the recommendations that we have were actually mentioned by Lorna. Um, for adult entertainment sites in particular, um, we recommend following the protocol for minors where age is indeterminate. So those individuals who are post-pubescent, um, and where it's difficult to tell by visual inspection only if that individual is a minor um, or over 18. Um, these sites we also recommend should not permit screenshots or downloads, uh, should request confirmation, not just of age, but actually also of consent. Um, and we know that that can't be verified, but even that friction um, might deter some potential perpetration. And professional productions can retain intimacy coordinators. We also know that uh, many companies have their servers located in different countries of the world. So arriving at some common understanding or common global standards could be helpful. Um, and for all tech platforms, we are um, eager to see prominent and easy to use in-app reporting. I think Lorna mentioned this, uh, instead of relying on text heavy reporting, um, responding to reports, including what action was taken in the app. Um, I think actually I'll, I'll point to Facebook and Instagram who I think offer a model that's uh, quite useful there, uh, allowing for anonymous and trusted flagger reporting. I'd really love to see conversation. I'd love to learn more about my end-to-end um, -end encrypted products where we see the vast majority of um, perpetration take place. Um, and also uh, blocking previously identified NCP from being re-uploaded. Again, I really want to note Sophie's expertise that she's cultivated over years in this space. Stop NCII, which has made so many phenomenal inroads in blocking um, uh, sort of the previously updated, uh, uploaded NCP, as well as blocking images that have not yet appeared. And I know that technology is advancing to address cropped and filtered content. Um, hopefully that will be robust soon too. And uh, one thing we also, that would be so helpful would be if tech companies can disable repeat catfishing accounts, which generally groom thousands of um, 
of users at a time. And those catfishing accounts will usually use the same image, a similar image, a similar handle, including prominent warnings um, to deter searches. And also, you know, we know that safe search and content, content controls are made available for family plans where there are children. And it could be helpful to raise those for adult users who simply might want to be allies and search in uh, safer modes. If that's called something other than child safety, we really could see an uptick in use of those tools. Um, I think Lorna mentioned as well, um, human content moderators, and I think it's key to establish humane working conditions for those content mo moderators and to expand personnel significantly. Um, we also recommend conducting an external audit uh, as opposed to simply internal audits and publishing annual transparency reports. I um, can touch on health quickly if we still have a few moments. Um, Dr. Asia Eaton, again, in the research that I mentioned before, we noticed that individuals who have experienced IBSA are av avoiding distressing feelings through three major strategies, and those include distraction, substance abuse, social withdrawal. And those who do seek support um, are disclosing to family and friends, participating in virtual communities, and seeking help from professionals. So making sure that individuals can um, seek support for their physical and mental health. Uh, it could be useful in health settings, particularly seeing nurses. Um, if uh, the intake questionnaire includes a question uh, as to whether or not the assault was recorded, which would allow for a referral to take place immediately. We'd love to see new curricula developed at psychology departments um, to address image-based sexual abuse. And we always recommend if someone is working with a therapist or talking to a friend that they can recommend um, CCRI's website. And uh, in the United States, we do face challenges with an overburdened and, and very expensive healthcare system. And so providing robust care um, at, a, a, at a reasonable cost would be helpful for all survivors. And taking a note, um, I can close here from you and women for leading this incredible convening related to tech facilitated abuse, the World Health Organization can also incorporate IBSA prevention and survivor support in its comprehensive mental health action plan and related fact sheets. Um, I will stop sharing there because I know I'm at time. And thank you so much. Thank you, and Michelle. And uh, thank you for sharing this uh, CCRI experience and uh, for protecting the uh, people. And especially I'm so moved to hear that and, uh, about uh, mental health and necess necessities because uh, even the image is erased, but uh, uh, even the, the, the she uh, he have to uh, live uh, with this kind of experience. And so, the, thank you for your sharing uh, your um, actions. So um, next we will um, uh, hear about the situation in Japan and the Kazuko uh, that take the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'm so moved by the presentation made by other speakers. And, mm -hmm. yeah, and the situation is very, very serious in all the countries, uh, but uh, we try to make a difference. So I want to talk about the situation in Japan and uh, my slide is not going very well. Okay, yes. Uh, my name is Kazuko Ito and I'm a vice president of Human Rights Now and also the human rights and lawyers uh, a practice in this area. 
uh, for uh, 10 years. And I'm going to talk about that the digital sexual violence against women in Japan. We have certain progress, but challenges. So I, I wanted to share that my experience. And Human Rights Now uh, is uh, the organizer of this event, and uh, we are human rights, international human rights NGOs with ECOSOC status. And then, uh, so we uh, worked on that various kind of issues, including a uh, women's rights issue, children's rights issue, and business and human rights. And I'd like to say happy International Women's Day today. And so, yes. So this is the statistics about gender-based violence in Japan. And so online violence and offline violence uh, against women and girls are deeply connected and reinforce each other. And also as uh, the rape culture is very prevailing in Japan. Then I wanted to uh, explain that overview of the Japanese legal system uh, first of all, the rape crime uh, in Japan is not content-based. So the, uh, the definition of rape is quite narrow. And uh, either use of force or threat uh, is required to establish the crime of rape. So this is quite narrow. So that is why our Japanese government is right now uh, you know, discussing to how to amend this law. And also that we have uh, the regulation on that obscenity, but again, the most of the pornography does not fall under this other uh, definition. And we have the act of the child pornography, but only apply to the person under 18 years old without any effective age verification system. And also the definition of the child, like, child porn is very narrow. And we have the revenge porn act enacted in 2014, but recording or videotaping of sexual behavior without consent itself is not considerably considered as a crime. And uh, this is a huge problem right now. So uh, without any consent, somebody is taking uh, the, you know, the sex of other people, and then uh, that the people and women subjected to the kind of you know, recording have enormous fear about that, you know, when it's going to be uploaded online. So this is a huge issue. And right now, our uh, Ministry of Justice in Japan is considering to amend the penal code to tackle the problem. But today, uh, I'd like to focus more on that uh, the issue, uh, really extremely serious problem uh, that uh, Human Rights Now has been tackling uh, for years. Uh, this is a forced recruitment of women in the adult porn industry in Japan. So Human Rights Now, uh, you know, in 2016, uh, published an investigative report on the issue and that revealed that many young women who never intended to appear in porn were forced to do so. So many victims were deceived and believed that they are to be a model of talent when they are scouted and signed a contract with a porn agency without knowing. And once the victim signs a contract, the agency demands them to perform porn. And then what they say is that this is, you know, in the contract, you can't breach the contract. And if you refuse, you have to pay the high amount of the penalty fees. And if you cannot pay that money, will inform your parents and school. Then uh, the women are tricked and no, uh, you know, no choice but you know, performing porn. So uh, this is a huge, very serious violation against women and human rights violation against women. So um, you know, this is uh, the, the uh, structure of entrapment. The scout is the first person uh, to contact to the women. Often they uh, deceive and uh, trick women. You know, you can be a model, you can be a singer, et cetera, et cetera. And then bring her to the agent, uh, you know, adult porn agent. And then women believing they can be, you know, the dream job. Um, but, uh, you know, and then uh, without knowing uh, that uh, concludes a contract uh, with adult porn agency. 
And then once uh, the contract is signed, the adult phone agency have entire control over the women. And she had no decision-making power to act or reject any performance. And if she refused, you know, the pay, the penalty fee, et cetera, there are lots of in, uh, in, intimidations. And script of the video of the story are provided a day before or even the day of the filming. And Japanese adult porn usually includes real sex with multiple men and women are sexually abused and tortured. So women cannot escape from the filming. And all the sexual intercourse, you know, this is not consensual, are recorded and distributed through the internet. And filmmakers uh, own the copyright permanently and use them over time. So victims suffer from endless digital sexual violence. That's the situation we highlighted. So we also highlight some case example. Uh, this is one example. And then victimization started from the high school age and recruited as a parent. But uh, you know, later she was forced to do the adult form. And when she rejected, she was uh, you know, demanded uh, around say 200,000 US dollars as a penalty fee. That's the issues. And this case is more serious. Women are forced to appear into porn, although she terminated the contract to the agency. She could not stop the distribution of pornographic video. And due to the stress, she committed suicide. Yeah, she died. That's the situation. Yeah, because for her, it is sexual abuse. And then sexual abuse against her is recorded and become a product and everybody enjoy eternally. So this is very, very traumatized situations. And this is, uh, you know, uh, the legal, not illegal. And the agency and filmmaker are rarely prosecuted despite the forcible nature of the recruitment and the filming. And since the contracts show that women had given their consent to perform in the form. Yes. So yeah, huge impunity over the issues. But in 2016, we publicized this report as uh, things are uh, changed. Uh, after the publication, we got huge backlash from the industry. But it was, I can't believe that it's really wonderful that uh, some of the survivors are uh, voiced up. You know, this is indeed true happening to us, that they said. I really appreciate their courageous. And they led the change in both society and policy. In 2017, the government, Japanese government established the interministerial committee to tackle the issues, but not the regulation uh, to the industry, but focusing on the prevention and awareness raising among young people. But we think it's not really enough. So we recommend comprehensive legislation to regulate uh, that industry to prevent and protect the women and girls and sometimes boys. Yes. And then later on, uh, five years later, uh, last year, finally, Japanese parliament adopt the comprehensive legislation to prevent and protect the victim of non-consensual porn. That's a huge success yeah, for us. Numbers of reasons was behind. Uh, one of the reasons was that due to the COVID, uh, that the victimization has grown. Yeah. And then I'm going to try to, uh, you know, time is so limited, but uh, introduce about that uh, overview of the act. One very important aspect is the procedure of safeguard of the prevention of the non-consensual pornography. So Article 3 uh, is talking about the fundamental principle that filmmakers shall not force a performer into any sexual act. And then based on that, the filmmakers are obliged to provide detailed written performance contracts uh, with additional explanatory documents to the performers. And from the con uh, contract to filming, must uh, had uh, the, the period, one month period at least. And after the uh, filming and to publication, uh, there should be 
at least four months. That is, uh, they'll try to ensure the victim to escape from the industry if they wish. Another important thing is that the law provides measures to prevent and end digital violence. So in case a filmmaker fails to meet the obligation under the act, contract is either uh, considered void or cancelled. But very important things is Article 13 said performance can unilaterally cancel the contract without any reason before the publication and until two years after the publication. And the filmmaker cannot impose any sanction fee to the cancellation. And as a result of the cancellation of the contract, the filmmaker is obliged to restore the original state for the performance, including cessation of the publication. And the performer is entitled to demand the cessation and prevention of the publication of films. And also, uh, the law accepts that the service provider are exempt from liability when they uh, take measures to prevent transmission upon the request of the victim. And both natural and legal persons, that means company, are imposed criminal sanction when certain of the provision of the act was violated. Yes, that huge success and improvement for the victim of the cyber-based violence and non-consensual porn in Japan. Yeah, but uh, we, you know, this law was immediately implemented and enforced. So I'm now, as a practitioner, uh, you know, uh, working on that cases. And then we found some challenges. So one challenge is that the problem of compliance and some case shows that industry culture has not entirely improved. And there's also no governmental agency supervising the porn industry. So compliance is a problem. And there is no punishment for those who pu publish the porn video against the performer's demand in accordance with the act. That's another issue. And huge issue is transnational cases. Uh, it's particularly difficult to solve. Uh, the case is like, you know, the you know, filming is uh, conducted in Japan, but uh, the filmmaker sent this kind of uh, material to the foreign platform, and foreign platform published the poll online, and Japanese people can look at that. So uh, this is a big problem, and we have to sue the foreign company in the foreign com countries. That's the major issue right now, so we wanted to discuss with you guys. And to eliminate all the image and video online, the victim must go to the various governmental bureau in Bain, and the response is very ineffective. Without any legal authority, the bureau can only advise to the victim or request to the operator to stop publication. There is no, you know, uh, the competence to order something uh, to the private sector. That's something missing. So I'm moving forward. So I would have some recommendation and something I'm really wondering. And one recommendation is to strengthen the duty of the government. So it's important to establish and assign as a supervising authority to enforce the law. And also establish a one-stop victim support center to eliminate images on, on, uh, on the videos. I had the South Korean government establish one-stop victim support center. That's a very good example, and we need to learn from that. And second recommendation is that imposing the duty of relevant industry, such as not only the filmmaker, but also the platformers, service providers, big tech companies, etc. And beyond the UN guiding principle of business and human rights, uh, this is not binding. So binding obligation. For instance, the Japanese very famous platformer NTT does not really working on that issue. So we are tackling in the issue, but uh, there is no uh, you know mandatory law regulation to the platformer. That's another issue. And tackling the transnational cases. So this is, uh, you know, uh, we uh, welcome uh, that the international discussion and international some agreement and also involvement with the service provider and big tech companies that is 
really important. And another issue is that uh, you know this new legislation will be amended in two years, and we are reviewing the practice and uh, sub several uh, you know uh, regulatory development uh, is discussed among the civil societies. One is that the uh, right to be forgotten, even if uh, you perform uh, with consent, you know ten years later they wanted to eliminate all the uh, images. Is there any that kind of rights? So uh, this is one thing that law should uh, clarify. And expanding the sanction is very important. And other issue is whether certain activities should be regulated or prohibited. And for instance, sexual intercourse should be prohibited. That's a big uh, argument in Japan. And also abusive conduct causing harm uh, to the health and safety of women. That is another recommendation. And also in relation to the rape cultures, so uh, like a UK law, then, you know, elimination of the, the rape and Im uh, abuse images, that is another choice. So we are now discussing that how to improve this uh, new law. So uh, uh, in the end, uh, so I'd like to say uh, we have serious problem right now in Japan, but we try to tackle the issues. Yeah, but we need to improve a lot of things, uh, despite the fact we get uh, very successful uh, advocacy to achieve the law. Yes, so in order to uh, protect women and girls, and sometimes boy online. We need to keep working on that issue. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kazuko. And uh, as maybe now that so you know that what's happened uh, recently in Japan, and uh, we uh, human rights now uh, doing a lot of work and uh, to achieve this kind of the law. So. And so next and the last speaker uh, of this panel, and we will have our final speaker, uh, Ms. Cindy Gallup. Cindy, uh, please take the floor. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about why I started Make Love Not Porn and what it is. And then I want to share with you all three things that we do at Make Love Not Porn that um, I think will bring some different perspectives to this extremely important issue. So um, I started Make Love Not Porn um, 14 years ago because I date younger men and I experienced for myself um, what happens when we don't talk openly and honestly about sex in the real world. Um, porn becomes sex education by default in not a good way. So um, 14 years ago, I put up on No Money, a tiny clunky website at makelovenotporn.com that in its original iteration was just words. The construct was porn world versus real world. Here's what happens in the porn world. Here's what really happens in the real world. I launched Make Love Not Porn at TED in 2009. My TED talk went viral. Thousands of people wrote to me from every country in the world, and I realized I'd uncovered a huge global social issue. And so I turned Make Love Not Porn into a business designed to do good and make money simultaneously. So today, Make Love Not Porn is pro-sex, pro-porn, pro-knowing the difference. We are the world's first and only user-generated, 100% human curated social sex video sharing platform. So a kind of what Facebook would be if it allowed you to socially, sexually self express. The way to think about us is, if porn is the Hollywood blockbuster movie, make love not porn is the badly needed documentary. We are a unique window onto the funny, messy, loving, wonderful sex we all have in the real world. We are socializing and normalizing sex, bringing it out of the shadows into the sunlight to promote consent, communication, good sexual values and behavior. We are literally sex education through real world demonstration. I designed Make Love Not Porn around a revenue sharing business model to democratize access to income. Our members pay to subscribe, rent and stream social sex videos. 
half that income goes to our contributors, who we call our make love not porn stars. Um, and here are three things we're doing that, um, as I say, bring some different perspectives um, to this issue. So the male founders of the giant tech platforms that dominate our lives today, they are not the primary targets online and offline of harassment, abuse, sexual assault, violence, rape, revenge porn. Therefore, they did not and they do not proactively design for the prevention of any of those things on their platforms. And as we've been hearing, we see the results of that every single day. Those of us who are most at risk every single day, women, black people, people of color, LGBTQ, the disabled, we design safe spaces and safe experiences. I and my tiny team spent literally years concepting and designing Make Love Not Porn before we ever built it. Because we knew that if we were going to invite people to do something they've never done before, socially share their real world sex, we had to think through every possible ramification of that to create a completely safe and trustworthy space. As a result, not only do we operate unlike anybody else in the adult sphere, we operate unlike anybody else on the internet, period. And that's because I designed Make Love Not Porn through the female lens to be the safest place on the internet. I designed it around what everybody else should have, nobody else did, human curation. There is no self-publishing of anything on Make Love Not Porn. Our curators watch every frame of every video submitted from beginning to end before we approve or reject the video and we publish it. Nobody else does that. We review every post on every member profile, text, photos, illustration. And by the way, on Make Love Not Porn, your profile posts can be as safe work or not safe work as you like, but we review them and we approve and publish them. No one else does that. We review every comment on every video before we approve or reject it and publish it. Nobody else does that. We can vouch for every single piece of content on our platform in a way that nobody else can. And we take human curation to lengths nobody else on the internet has even dreamed of. It's not possible to complete our video submissions process unless your video is fully consensual and legal. We require full identifying details for every participant and two forms of government issued ID. Um, most adult sites only require one, um, including, by the way, if you've chosen to have somebody else behind the camera. Even if we never see them, we have to know exactly who they are. We need two forms of visual ID from them as well. But importantly, even when your video submission has passed all of those safeguards, our curators are brief to watch those videos. And, and generally speaking, we're viewing just for are they consensual, are they real? But our curators are brief to watch those videos and you know, ask themselves, do I feel the camera is in a position where everybody knows it's there? Do I have a bad feeling about this video? Because our brief to our curators is a bad feeling is enough reason not to publish it. You don't have to follow that up with any kind of rational explanation. Also, um, when any of our Make Love Not Porn stars want their videos removed, we do that instantly. And when I say instantly, what I mean is we have no online application form. We have no process. All you do is you message us and we remove your videos immediately. The Make Love Not Porn star messaged us the other day and within 10 minutes their videos were gone. Nobody else on the internet anywhere does that. And I'm making this point because I want you to be aware that this is what the future of the internet looks like when it's designed and built by women through the female lens. But here in the US last year, only 1.7% of all venture capital funding went to female founders. And that is equally true around the rest of the world. We are designing the future of the internet to give a better future to humanity, and we do not access capital to enable us to scale what we want to build. And that's something very important to bear in mind as we look at how um, we can role model for tech platforms what they should be doing. Um, at Make Love Not Porn, we're tiny, we're bootstrapping, we have no money, and we've human curated everything for 10 years. Imagine what all those platforms with their billions could be doing if they chose to. So that's the first point I wanted to share. The second is, I designed Make Love Not Porn around my own beliefs and philosophies 
One of which is that everything in life starts with you and your values. So I regularly ask people this question, what are your sexual values? And nobody can ever answer me because we're not taught to think like that. Our parents bring us up to have good manners, a work ethic, sense of responsibility, accountability. Nobody ever brings us up to behave well in bed, but they should. Because in bed, values like empathy, sensitivity, generosity, kindness, honesty, respect are as important as those values are in every other area of our lives where we're actively taught to exercise them. And I'm sharing this with you because ultimately our mission at Make Love Not Porn is to end rape culture. And we work to do that by doing something incredibly simple that nevertheless nobody else anywhere on the internet is doing. We work to end rape culture by showing you how wonderful, great consensual communicative sex is in the real world. Our social sex videos role model, good sexual values and good sexual behavior. And here's the important part. We make all of that aspirational versus what you see in porn and popular culture. We are reinventing aspirational culture around sex in order to drive the massive emotional mindset shift that has to happen to end rape culture. And what is interesting too, is that I designed Make Love Not Porn to be fully diverse and inclusive. And we are. Our members, our Make Love Not Porn stars, are male, female, trans, non-binary, straight, LGBTQ, or racist ethnicities. But we've observed in the 10 years we've been operating that we are especially a revelation to men. More men write appreciative emails, leave appreciative comments with Make Love Not Porn than anybody else because we are something unique men will find nowhere else on the internet, which is a safe space where men can be and watch other men being open, emotional, and vulnerable around sex. You wouldn't believe the number of men who write to us and say, I just watched my first video Make Love Not Porn and afterwards I cried. I wish society understood the opposite of what it, what it thinks is true. Women enjoy sex just as much as men and men are just as romantic as women. Yet neither gender is allowed to openly celebrate that fact. We'd all be a lot better off if they were. And so we are one of the solutions to toxic masculinity, which is one of the underlying social cultural dynamics that drives this appalling issue that we're all here to talk about today. And the third and final um, point that I want to share with you is, you know, I've, uh, our community at Make Love Not Porn writes to us every day, um, telling us how we've changed their lives. You know, I have seen firsthand every day for the past 14 years, the enormous human unhappiness and misery caused by the shame, embarrassment and guilt with which we imbue sex. The issue we're talking about today is massively exacerbated by the, this societal guilt and shame. And when I talk about our vision at Make Love Not Porn of one day being the Facebook of social sex, of destigmatizing sex in the real world, bringing it out of the shadows into the sunlight, I talk about the fact that one day nobody should ever have to feel embarrassed or ashamed about having a naked photograph or a sex video themselves post on the internet because it's simply just a natural human part of who we all are. That day is a very long way off, but we also help shift the dynamics around this issue when we take the shame, the guilt, and the embarrassment out of the universal human experience that we are all most engaged with and most messed up about. And, um, and an indication of how powerful it is when, when we do that is that um, I've been um, really blown away at Make Love Not Porn to be contacted by many survivors of rape, sexual assault, sexual abuse, who tell us that we help them reclaim their bodies. We help them feel able to be sexual again. And that's not just our members who view our videos, but our contributors, our Make Love Not Porn stars, who tell us that sharing themselves sexually in a completely safe space help them process and heal from sexual trauma and abuse. And so, you know, as I said, I wanted to share with you how we operate to just bring some different perspectives to play on this issue, to look at what all of the tech platforms could be doing if they chose to do it, 
our human curation model is eminently scalable. It's simply our version of any enterprise software unicorns, human sales force. They hire thousands of people to sell. You can absolutely hire thousands of people to curate. Um, it's important to think about how we end rape culture and reinvent aspirational culture around sex so that what everybody wants to model is good sexual values and behavior. And it's also really important to take the shame, the guilt, and the embarrassment out of sex, which absolutely exacerbates all of the issues we're talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. Now also that you say that um, the stop rape culture is very important uh, and, uh, in every uh, country. And also that uh, I'm so moved because uh, safe space for sexual behavior uh, should be happened in the digital uh, setting, not only a real world and also that uh, even the um, a digital world and the safe uh, safe space and for the people. And now we should uh, turn to the panel discussion. So could you uh, join us uh, to the panel discussion? So we uh, prepare the five topics uh, for the panel discussion. The, uh, every country has uh, uh, own laws and uh, to uh, protect uh, <clears throat> the safety in the online and especially relating to the uh, unconsensual uh, sexist images. And also the every country has some kind of the uh, uh, criminal law uh, to uh, uh, protect the people and uh, from uh, unconsensual uh, abusive uh, sexual images. But the uh, criminal law is necessary, but as uh, 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 the Sophie mentioned, as uh, not all the uh, uh, cases uh, will be uh, punished. So do you have any comment about uh, uh, legal uh, uh, things? And, uh, Maybe the, uh, the mission you mentioned about the, there's a no and the federal uh, the law and against uh, the uh, non sexual, uh, uh, non consensual uh, sexual images. And uh, so, do you have any uh, comment about the, Sure. The sure. Yes. Thanks so much. Uh, two items. Yes. Uh, right now, we do not have a federal law. Um, federal criminal law regarding this conduct, as I mentioned, that has been introduced um, into the Senate uh, just last week. Um, I'm sure someone might want to know, oh, Michelle, do you think it's going to pass this time? Well, I thought it was going to pass last year, so uh, it's difficult for me to uh, have a crystal ball and understand what will happen in that regard. Um, but I um, I think there was a question earlier about um, whose responsibility it should be or to, to remove images and also, um, you know, what kind of happens with tech companies, how are they involved and what kind of responsibility do they have? And I mentioned in um, my 15 minutes that there's actually a subcommittee hearing today uh, that is relevant to this subject. And I um cannot share that in the chat i don't think i can share it with hosts and panelists so i um i will put this to hosts and panelists and maybe one of our hosts can share that with the group and this uh this hearing will refer to uh section 230 of the cda and and, and broadly what um responsibility tech platforms have in regard to this kind of conduct. Okay, thank you. And uh, also, the so, uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't see that Sophie is uh, uh, raise your hand. And uh, could you say uh, something about uh, uh, legal uh, things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I think laws are really important, obviously. And as I said in my in my 15 minutes, we do have a law in the UK and we've had it since 2015. It's not really fit for purpose anymore, but there is work that is going on around that. But legislation isn't the only thing that you need because we have legislation now, that, but our law enforcement don't really understand it. People that go to the police um, get confusing messaging back. So we need a huge amount of awareness raising and training, serious training with our law enforcement frontline professionals mm-hmm. so that they understand what the law is, what it means, how you apply it to people with real lived experiences, how to collect evidence. There is no consistent uh, um, understanding, even in, even in one part of the UK, even in England, about what that what meaningful evidence that will succeed in a prosecution looks like. So I think there's a huge amount of work to do. I think legislation is really important. It's that cultural line drawn in the sand where we say this is not acceptable behaviour, but it needs so much more than that. Okay, and uh, how about Laura? Um, following up from, from what uh, Sophie said about the... The, the need to give uh, training to, to law enforcement. There is a question about resources as well. Uh, you know, they need adequate resources. I think if we're talking online, there is a question between how we want to treat the people who are creating the content and sharing it, which is one sort of culpability and, uh, you know, sort of an, an engagement and how we treat the the platforms uh, and the distributors. And they may actually have different engagement with with content as well. So I think we can't just say it's a one size fits all approach. We may want to have um, one set of laws for the people creating the content who are in a position to know uh, that this is non-consensual perhaps other laws in relation to to different to- sorts of distribution, so. Yeah, okay, so thank you, uh, uh, Lona. So, so I'm so impressed with your uh, fall and framework and also that the first uh, the might be happens, uh, content creation. And so, so also that uh, maybe the uh, in the stage of content creation, and uh, we have to think about uh, is this abusive or not, and then the consensual or unconsensual, and a lot of things I have to uh, think about the, uh, creation, creation level. And also the ones that uh, some images uh, are created, and also then the next days and uh, uh, happen. And also the we are, uh, uh, I'm thinking so, uh, maybe we should think about uh, the, how to create uh, better and uh, uh, sexual images and also that like uh, the Japanese situation and the Kazuko mentioned that the filming is a part of creation. Uh, so these are kind of things in my, is, this is very important. And also that the, maybe the time is only 20 minutes and also that the, maybe and the, so many questions and the, comes uh, to, so it is a very difficult to, to uh, read through, so. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so the, the first question there is about opportunities to update the legislation in the UK. And yes, I'm, I'm pleased to say that, that there, there are um, moves uh, afoot. So the, the law was reviewed by the Law Commission in the UK. They started their work about three years ago and they reported back last summer to government um, with a, a, a complete overhaul of um, the law around recommendations of the law around taking, making and sharing intimate images. And um, for anyone who knows anything about uh, UK politics and the parliamentary timetable, it's quite full of a lot of other things. So getting space and time and attention on this issue it has been really, really challenging, but uh, through a lot of work from a lot of people, um, it's now coming through um, in as part, hopefully, of the online safety bill. We're optimistic that there's going to be an amendment coming mm-hmm. to include some of these changes into that legislation. It's not going to be everything that the Law Commission recommended, but it's going to be a, a good start, I think, in, in removing some of those barriers that make it very, very difficult for people to report what has happened to them to the police. But like I said, there's, there's still lots more to do. I hope that more 
more will come down the line and i'm told that that is the intention um but yeah there's still lots of other things to do that that haven't been thought of around helping us to remove content so it, it's it's a it's a moving field definitely but but steps in the early steps in the right direction um, to actually, I, I will, if it's okay, answer the, the next question, which is to me, because again, I think it's important for people to hear what, um, you know, designing an internet platform through the female lens really means. So the question is, you know, um, to me, do, we, do you have any tools to avoid users from downloading the material? So um, again, part of concept in designing our platform was building in a ton of security from the ground up. Um, so the answer is um, absolutely. In 10 years of business operation, we have never had any of our videos downloaded from the platform. Um, now, um, because we have struggled to raise funding, um, and by the way, I'm working to raise a round of serious funding right now. And if anybody in the audience you know, knows any open-minded investors, send them my way. But um, uh, the, the, the thing now that people can do is screen record. There is technology um, to, um, to prevent screen recording. And that's one of the things I'm raising funding for because I want to be able to implement that across my platform. But um, again, in 10 years of business operation, we've had exactly two instances of somebody screen recording our videos and publishing them um, on porn platforms. Um, they are clearly our videos because every video is watermarked with Make Love Not Porn. And um, in the first instance, um, uh, uh, somebody published some videos to Pornhub. And one of our members alerted us to this because um, uh, because we've been going for 10 years, infuriatingly, the big porn sites use the tag make love not porn to try and hive off tra traffic from us and direct it to them um so we were made aware of this um i will i will say this for Pornhub: they do have a very efficient dmca takedown process so we um instantly reported these got them taken down within 24 hours we um emailed every um it, it was only a handful of make love not porn stars we emailed all of them um telling them what had happened um telling them what we'd done rather fortuitously the majority of the videos were um we have a category on make love not porn which is we are the only place on the internet where porn stars share videos of the sex they have in the real world which demonstrates the difference between porn and real world sex uh, because um, the, the sex porn stars have in their real world relationships is not the sex they perform professionally. The majority of these make love of porn stars fell into that category. They all went, ah, oh, fine. <laughs> I'm all over the internet anyway. That's, uh, there are a couple of um, non porn star everyday people who, who said they really appreciate our care and concern. In the second instance, um, these were published to other porn platforms. I um, did my research, I found the name and the email address of the CEO of the server that hosted these platforms. I went after him um, and I, I, I know a number of high profile people in the tech world, um, which I used, and he ordered our videos removed from those platforms immediately. I don't know of any other platform whose CEO would go to that much trouble to make damn sure that um, that, um, that that content was removed immediately. Um, so only two instances in 10 years of operation, working to raise the funding to put inability to screen record across our platform, and that will never be possible again. But that is how seriously we take the issue of any dissemination beyond our platform of our content and how much we make sure it's removed to protect our members and our Make Love Not Porn stars. Thank you, Cindy. And uh, also the the fourth question. So maybe the someone could answer that. Are there any discussion about how to prevent a uh, profit-driven uh, market that may express the women against for the victimization? Oh, Michelle, please. Sure. So um, in reading the question, I think the second part is around uh, profit around deleting the images. Uh, it, I think that there's a couple parts to that question, so I'll tackle that part. So in the U.S., um, and I'm sure globally, there are a number of um, 
services, subscription services that will do what's called reputation management Mm -hmm. and will use certain tools to um, work with somebody to find where they are online, either their names, their addresses, other public information, private information that they don't want public, including images. And um, this serves a purpose because it uh, lifts some of the time burden and some of the anguish that someone who has experienced Mm -hmm. IPSA would have to um, allocate to that search, even if that search is a bit quicker these days than it was perhaps five years ago. Um, one thing uh, for CCRI is we sometimes people ask us to endorse a certain business and we, we cannot do that. What we encourage individuals to do is t- two things. Number one, definitely look at the terms and conditions of those uh, image monitoring services and look at their cancellation policies because often there are subscriptions that have a monthly fee or a quarterly fee or have a bundling of some sort. So definitely pay attention to those um, to those terms and conditions. And second, we recommend looking at re- online reviews of that company. Um, and then third, uh, Uh, please know that CCRI does not endorse, we do not endorse, we do not not endorse any of these companies. If you see our logo on the pages for any of these companies, please know that we do not endorse them and that there is some sort of misunderstanding uh, in, in, in that. And CCRI does not charge for any of our services. So, uh, we do ask people to be alert for scams and so forth. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Now, how about Rona? Uh, thank you. Um, I think in the UK there are probably mm. reputation management uh, services uh, equivalent to what Michelle was talking about. Mm-hmm. I would just say that uh, in the UK we probably still have the right to be forgotten as a tool uh, in that in that regard, uh, which I, I think was mentioned by one of the, the, the other panelists. Uh, but just to say that if the question is trying to hint at the fact that a, a platform that is hosting content refuses to take content down unless there is a payment, um, I wonder whether that is a form of extortion, but I'm not a criminal lawyer. Uh, But to say that within the framework of the Online Safety Bill or the Online Safety Act, as it will be, it requires platforms to have effective um, responses to complaints. And I cannot imagine that making people pay uh, for that is going to be acceptable. The, the the bill in particular says that platforms must enforce their terms of service. So I would say that, that quite apart from questions as to whether this is bad enough as a behaviour to engage the, the criminal law, it's unlikely to comply with the UK regime when it comes into force. Thank you, Rona. And how about Sophie, you want to say something about that? Yes, I was I was just uh, going to say, I think any platform that asks for payment for the removal of content is not operating in good faith. And, and I would strongly encourage anybody not to, to, to do that. But the, on the Revenge Porn Helpline, we've had cases where people in the UK have gone to UK reputation management companies, and then those companies have come to us to remove the content, which you can understand just, you know, little bit uh, um, yes uh, difficult to, to deal with but um, we found ways around that but it, it, some of these companies are not operating ethically I, I would argue and we are very clear that the service that we offer we are as effective um, as anyone else beyond the, anybody who has a direct ability to remove that content and we are a free service and will remain so. 
And Kazuko, do you want to say something about the Japanese situation relating to these uh, issues? Uh, you know, that we don't really have, you know, the right to be forgotten and the new law just imposed. And so, you know, that, that most of the case, uh, we don't really have the industry uh, like UK or US at all. So there is no, you know, reputation risk management service at all. So, you know, maybe next step, uh, maybe we will have this kind of problem, but not yet. So we have a lot of challenges uh, in Japan. So, and also there's the last question, and that uh, is there any project of the international agreement about removing image, the video online? So that is, it will be very important, I think so uh, as well. And do you have any uh, comment about that, about this uh, question or? I don't think so. So that is why we hold this, you know, uh, you know, meeting. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are lots of laws and we have tackling a lot of problem, but there is mm -hmm. no international agreement. So that is why transnational cases has enormous difficulty. I hope that some, you know, effort to be made uh, to uh, uh, achieve the international agreement, uh, you know, as a uh, uh, treaty is the best way but not only treaty but also some industrial agreement would be very desirable i was so you know encouraged by the speech made by uh, cindy and then that kind of good ex good example and best practice would be incorporated to the all the industry that's uh you know is also desirable um yeah thank you very much and also that the time is only the four minutes left and uh, so maybe the, I need some very, very short comment and uh, uh, for uh, uh, from every speakers and uh, and uh, do you have any uh, encouraging message to the, the people who are uh, combating this kind of situation? Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd like to pick up on what Kazuko just said. I think there is an importance for international cooperation, maybe not uh, a, a treaty. I think that would be very ambitious. But I think if we even just our various groups, uh, the NGOs and the like, if, if we talk to each other and try and uh, develop an understanding and perhaps some common solutions and share best practice, then we can start saying there is an international community here and this is acceptable and that is not. And even if it is just uh, the court of public opinion, maybe we can start to use that. Thank you, Rona. And uh, how about the, Sophie? Yeah, I completely agree with Lorna and uh, part of the work that I'm doing around Stop NCII is that we have NGO, our NGO partners from organisations around the world is to create exactly that dialogue and that working together because <clears throat> all, uh, a lot of these sort of solutions and, and conversations are happening in very sort of white westernised, industrialised uh, countries, but we need to recognise that intermittent image abuse looks different around the world and we need to develop solutions that need to be global solutions the internet is a global thing so we need global solutions that that can can flex to, to suit different um, um, communities and and cultures because you know it's, we're not a one size fits all globe and, and I would never want us to be but so it's exactly that communication I'm really trying to build it's a yeah it's, it's a quite a big planet really but um, there's a lot of goodwill at the moment and and there's a lot of awareness raising and events like this um, and a lot of the events that are happening at the UNCSW is really doing a huge amount of work to raise awareness and keep this conversation moving. And, and if you, you want something positive, um, I, do, I do think we are definitely moving forward and, and uh, getting people at, at sort of very high levels of government and policy development and even and yes, tech companies to, to recognise the importance of this issue and that it is really time to do something about it. Thank you, Sophie. Is it Maybe Michelle? Cindy will go. And so I would like... Um, ah, okay, Cindy, okay. If, if you don't mind, yes, because so, so. I'm, I'm afraid I have to jump off in a moment. So okay. um, I'm, I'm regularly asked in interviews, um, usually at the end of the interview by the, by the journalist, so Cindy, when do you think all of this will change? 
when do you think we'll be less messed up about sex? And my response is always, you asked that question in the wrong way because you asked it in the passive tense. All of this changes when you and I and everyone else make it change. And I don't wait for things to change. I make them change. I'm blown away by what every person on this panel today is doing to change and solve this appalling issue. And I just want to say that I'm enormously optimistic because of all the work we're doing and because we're all doing it through the female lens that we will absolutely drive change around this and we will see a very different picture in a few years time. And I'm, I'm just very heartened um, and very, very happy to, to have been a part of this discussion. So thank you all very much indeed. And thank I've got you, to go. Cindy. Yeah, and thank you, Cindy. Cindy should go to another uh, yeah, the, the webinar or something like that. So thank you, Cindy. <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, the next one is Michelle. Can I just say, is Cindy extraordinary or what? Uh, just what a phenomenal speaker, what phenomenal work she's doing. That was very inspiring. Um, so there was a question posed about cooperation across mm -hmm. um, national boundaries. And TCRI has done a very small amount of this in select and very, very complex cases. And so really what that is, is um, complex case management with a lot of different moving parts and a lot of different professionals. And um, if you do that just in your own state or in your own country, really complex cases can take 10 months to sort through. Um, and working globally is um, introduces other considerations around obtaining consent from everyone involved, uh, finding times to meet, having translators and interpreters, uh, understanding the different professions and professional titles that are involved. And each time I've been involved in something like this, there are usually around 20 professionals who are involved in different countries. So um, we've done this. It's, it's extremely complex case management. And uh, I think that there's room there for um, models and systems to be built. Um, it, it might be, a, a, we might be a little bit far off from that, but it's certainly possible. And in fact, before Stop NCII was on the scene, Sophie and I actually did a little bit of um, cross-border case management on a case. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wasn't that detailed, but even in that that situation alone, I think we had to talk five or six times, and we had to be very, very careful around consent, um, around all kinds, and how we were communicating, because that kind of thing you're not really going to be talking about over email, so we had to talk to each other. Uh, so I think that there's room to build out models, build out staffing, get resources um, outside of the treaties and, and global commitments rolling that out on the ground is, um, I think, an opportunity that we all can explore. Okay, thank you, and Michelle. And Kazuko, could you say something about uh, uh, closing, as, as a closing remarks, and uh, at the time so uh, uh, yeah, limited, and so, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, you could close uh, our panel. Okay, thank you very much, and um, Rona, uh, Sophie, and Michelle, and Cindy, uh, for your great presentation. And uh, we learned a lot. You know, uh, that so inspiring. Uh, in that, uh, you know, that improvement is law and practices, and your partnership with that, uh, you know, private sectors. That really, you know, uh, that uh, inspire to all of us. And not only myself, but also to the many participants. You know, this is issue that women and girls, and sometimes boys, are seriously hampered. And so we need to tackle the issues. Yes. And also, the, I'm so inspired by uh, that the Cindy's, you know, uh, that this is possible. Sometimes, you know, that, you know, industry can do that. So uh, this is possible. I was so inspired. So thank you very much. And then so 
Uh, in my case, uh, this is the first time for me and uh, uh, for Human Rights Now to share uh, that, uh, that the new laws development internationally. I hope that someone uh, was alarmed from the, our activities and courage and then same law and same situation. Uh, we can make some you know, suggestion uh, to solve the problem. Yes. And so maybe, you know, uh, this, you know, network is uh, I think it's great and then so let's keep in touch and then maybe we can start from that you know that the set up the own you know uh, the guiding principle of something and then all the business big tech company or service provider must agree on that so maybe uh, this could be a starting point of the discussion please stay in touch uh, thank you very much and also thank you very much for the participant so thank you. So thank you very much. And uh, so then now we close the, the, this panel. And uh, so thank you for the uh, speakers and uh, thank you for the uh, uh, participants. And uh, if you interested in the uh, involved uh, this project, then uh, please um, the contact to the human rights now. Thank you so much. And uh, this is. Thank you for attending. Thank you so much to Thank everyone you. for attending Thank and you. to Human Rights Now. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank, Thank you for you today. So it's been a great event. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye.